Hi, I'm Don Berwick. I'm President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement here in Boston, Massachusetts, recording this for you, for you to use at your upcoming wonderful launch of the Q Primary Care Special Interest Group. I really wish I could be with you in person, and I will be, I'm sure, at some point in the near future. Um, I've been uh, asked a number of questions by the people who have organized this project, and I think I'll go through the questions they've asked, but let me just begin by expressing my enthusiasm for what you're doing. It's so exciting to see a group of leaders like you gel and emerge and work in such a key area of, uh, of, of work as primary care. Um, no system on earth in healthcare has been successful in meeting the needs of patients, communities, families that hasn't had a strong, vibrant, and continually evolving, continually improving primary care system. So you're right at the sharp edge of the work that needs to be done, not just in England, but globally. Thank you for your investment. Thank you for your leadership. And I look forward to working together. The first question I was asked was about priorities. <clears throat> As you know, if you've taken even the slightest look at the field of quality, you know that you never improve without aim. Aim is the, is the first step. Here we have riches. You have riches. There's guidance available to help you set the priorities for your work on improving care. You, of course, have the guiding documents of the English National Health Service and uh, the other elements of the UK um, back to its founding. Uh, you have the five-year forward view, which was a compelling document setting out a vision of the future of the English National Health Service. Um, <clears throat> but I want to refer you actually to, to a couple of other resources, um, which I think should be regarded as mandatory for you to read and master if you have not already. <clears throat> the first is American. It's the report Crossing the Quality Chasm. It appeared out of what used to be the called the Institute of Medicine in the United States in 2001, now called the National Academy of Medicine. <clears throat> it's the most prestigious scientific leadership body for medicine in my country. <clears throat> a committee was formed in the late 1990s to take an overview look at quality of healthcare in America. Uh, and that committee published two now rather well-known reports. The first in 1999, Two Air is Human, which dealt with patient safety, its defects and relevant goals. And then the second, and in some ways more important, because it's more comprehensive report, Crossing the Quality Chasm in 2001. I was on the committee that wrote that report and had a hand in writing it. Crossing the Quality Chasm is a very important document in my view. It sets out uh, a diagnostic image of the profiles of quality gaps in American healthcare, but that profile is absolutely worldwide. Uh, more recently, we now have three reports, which I'll mention uh, sh uh, in a minute uh, uh, more thoroughly, which are reviewing quality of care globally and come up with a, basically the same list of defects, dimensions for improvement. And I think it's important for you as potential leaders of improvement in primary care to take that report under strong advisement, read it thoroughly. The report establishes uh, six aims for the improvement of healthcare in America, you could adopt them in your context. They are safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, timeliness, efficiency, and equity. Safety is avoiding injuries to patients that come from the care that they count on, not from their diseases. Effectiveness refers to reliability, sometimes standardization, but always some form of adherence to the evidence base in using the techniques we do in health and healthcare. Uh, safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness was the third. Now a really important idea called people-centeredness or person-centeredness in the modern vocabulary. It means organizing care around the needs of individuals. Every patient is the only patient. We call that what matters to you medicine. That's the more recent vocabulary that I really love. Uh, the fourth dimension was timeliness. This was actually the first dimension in the UK in the late 1990s as you got to work really hard on delays, uh, unnecessary delays, unwanted delays in your care system. It's an element of quality to reduce delays through redesign. Um, efficiency was the fifth dimension, and that has to do with avoiding waste, which actually has to do with avoiding, with reducing unnecessary cost. And finally, equity. In my country, this is largely racial equity because the predictor of your health status in America is uh, embarrassingly the color of your skin and also the, the size of your bank account. Wealth and race are strong predictors of, of health and well-being, and they shouldn't be. We need to work on equality. That's, that's a wonderful list of candidate uh, agendas for improvement, candidate 
purposes, candidate aims, safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, timeliness, efficiency, and equity. I urge you as a special interest group now for primary care to take that list under advisement, work it through very thoroughly, and don't get trapped in a single aim. The whole portfolio matters. And I would urge you as a special interest group to embrace and adopt that in whatever vocabulary works in the British context. Uh, the second resource also came from my organization, from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, about five years after the Crossing the Quality Chasm report. It was contributed by two remarkable colleagues of mine, Dr. John Whittington, uh, an uh, internist, a uh, family doctor from Peoria, Illinois, and my mentor, uh, Dr. Tom Nolan, a protege of W. Edwards Deming. They are the actual authors of the concept of the triple aim, which rapidly became known even now globally, and my guess is you've had strong acquaintance with it. What, what Nolan and Whittington said was that the context of the CHASM report, safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, equitable care, had to do with, with the, experience, the total experience of care of individuals when they're in the care system whether they be well looking for a checkup or very sick in an intensive care unit. That's the vector, the collection of, of properties or aims for people in the system. But what Whittington and Nolan knew, and as primary care absolutely knows, is that the causes of health and well-being, the, the, the agents of illness, disease, and the burden, don't lie within healthcare. Healthcare is a repair shop. The causal system, the upstream system, lies in our communities. The health of the population is determined by factors far more important than healthcare itself, 400% more important technically in the epidemiologic literature. Factors like housing and transportation and nutrition, and physical activity, violence in our streets, racism, social justice, the criminal justice system, the air we breathe, the, 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 the water we drink. These are called the social determinants of health. Uh, your country has made a stronger investment in working upstream on those determinants than mine has. That's a historic fact. But it's still nowhere near what it needs to be. And especially for primary care, although I think for all of health care, uh, ad adopting the view that the aims we have go beyond the encounters with patients to the, to the causes of health and well-being in the population leads us to the second component of the triple aim, the well-being and health of populations. The third component has to do with resource use. Health and healthcare take resources from other social sectors. Uh, and the government side, what we spend on healthcare, we will not spend on housing or transport or rehabilitation of, uh, of returning uh, incarcerated people. Uh, we won't invest that money if we don't have it in the well being of children and, and the thriving of our schools. And so, if in the private sector, the same applies, since the money that supports healthcare in either a government system or, or, a, or a private system uh, comes from people, it comes from individuals, and it comes from the companies and corporations that employ those individuals one way or another through taxation or out-of-pocket costs. And so Winnington and Nolan say there has to be a third aim, which is stop the waste, avoid spending money we don't need to spend, reduce the cost per capita. And that became the triple aim that IHI promulgated when these, uh, these authors invented the idea in around 2006 or 2007. Better care for individuals, safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, equitable care. Better health for populations moving upstream and lower per capita cost. Even though the British per capita costs are far lower than the American costs, I am convinced from decades of interaction with the British National Health Service that you have plenty of opportunity for all three portions of the triple aim, including reducing costs through reducing waste. I think those would be suitable chartering ideas for the special interest group on primary care. I think you should be expansive, bold in your, in your selection of what you're going to work on together and separately. And I think those are two good charters. The third charter is now available due to three outstanding reports that appeared this year on the global stage, reports on the global chasm, the global quality chasm. One came from the Lancet Commission on high-performing high healthcare systems. Uh, one came from the World Health Organization in concert with the World Bank and OECD, and one came from the old Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, Medicine, a committee that I co-chaired with a colleague from Pakistan, Dr. Sanya Nishtar. All three reports appeared in, in August and September of 2008, eight, 2018. They, are, they should be taken under consideration. Mastering those reports, which give you a much more expansive view 
of the patterns of care and opportunity and defect at a global level, uh, I think are worthy of your attention. The aims adopted were pretty similar to what the Institute of Medicine has laid out with the addition of a couple of others, the most important of which is integrity. We didn't include integrity in the original vector of properties of healthcare systems, but in some settings, less I think perhaps in the UK than in others, but still worthy of scrutiny, is our uh, trustworthiness. Are we behaving with public resources and private resources the way we should? Uh, so if the question is, what should you work on? You have an embarrassment of opportunity here. Traditionally, it's patient safety that's been the sharp end of this wedge. It's well understood, very important. It has to do with a primum non nocere, do, first of all, do no harm guidance that we were all trained in as clinicians. I think safety is crucial, but I think it's too confining to think only of patient safety in any realm, including primary care. Do you have examples of progress in the UK? Absolutely you do in the primary care arena. For the past four years, one of my main roles as an international visiting fellow at the, at the King's Fund, which I have uh, had the privilege of uh, participating in now for, for, for four years, uh, one of my key roles has been to visit the Vanguard systems, the new care model systems that were previously supported in the English NHS. I've traveled all over your country. There were somewhat more than 50 vanguards. I, I believe I visited at least 40 of them through time, and many of them have focused heavily in the areas of primary care, community-based uh, health, and interfaces between the primary care and secondary care system. Uh, what I've seen has been thrilling. Now, I, I don't have the capacity or the time right now to recite to you the experience of the vanguards and, and, and all of the lessons learned, but I will tell you that if you become curious about this, perhaps reach out to those leaders in the health system who, who, uh, who sponsored the Vanguard process, like Samantha Jones, for example, uh, I think you will have be able to harvest a whole lot of stories that you can put to use in the special interest group. So let me suggest a Vanguard project, a new care models project. Be really aggressive, really persistent about asking for the stories and the testimony from those experiments. Not all worked, but some worked brilliantly. I'll mention the work, for example, of, uh, of, of uh, Duncan Gooseby uh, at Airwash in, in, uh, in Derbyshire. Uh, his work with their, commission, their uh, clinical care commissioning group is outstanding, building an integrated system of primary care access using far more uh, people than just doctors to allow people to gain rapid access to the primary care they needed to be linked almost instantly to other supports. Uh, terrific work went on in Morecambe Bay, including uh, telemedicine and telehealth linkages between primary care and referral networks. I've been impressed with what I saw at, at Tower Hamlet, uh, Hamlet's uh, Trust, where, where uh, new relationships have been formed based largely on a very fine database between consultants and general practitioners in that patch. So look for the vanguards. You're going to find some terrific examples of primary care innovations that ought to be embraced by the Q community. And, and the special interest group. If you look globally, you'll be even smarter because innovations in primary care are occurring all over the world. And as Lord Nigel Crisp has argued very strongly, we need in some ways to turn the world upside down because the innovations that are occurring in primary care in low and middle income settings, which have constraints you don't live under and are therefore forced to be more inventive than you are, those innovations have lessons to feed back into our system. There has been work done at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement with the assistance of the Commonwealth Fund to try to harvest some of those lessons. I'd ask you to invite Lord Crisp to your presence at one of your meetings and ask him to talk a bit more about his lessons learned, his theories about how we can import great models from low-income settings into the wealthier settings with great benefit to us. Um, in other countries, uh, under different funding systems and different uh, patterns of history, uh, other innovations have occurred. I am, as you may know, a great fan of healthcare in Sweden, especially Jönköping County, Sweden, where the uh, innovations that have occurred in, in, in primary care and its interfaces with specialty have been absolutely thrilling. Be globalists. Uh, ask for support to travel and study what's going on in other settings and other places. And one in the U.S. that you really do need to be familiar with if you're not already is the amazing system supported by South Central Foundation in Anchorage, Alaska. The Alaska natives, uh, indigenous people, under federal law in my country, uh, 
uh, can own their own healthcare system with federal financial support. They form tribal corporations, which then redesign care for themselves. The 60,000 Alaska Natives in the Anchorage, Alaska area formed the South Central Foundation, a corporation, a native corporation, and it now owns its own care system. And there has been birthed, I think, the most brilliant single example of redesign that I've seen anywhere in the world, the NUCA system, N-U-K-A. If you haven't studied NUCA, you should. In fact, I'd urge you to have visitors from South Central visit with you, and I would, I would think it not be on the the call of reason for you to travel to Alaska and see what's going on there. The King's Fund has done a great job creating some assets, including reports on primary care innovations, including NUCA. And you should gather and read carefully the King's Fund's reports on these, uh, these redesigns. Um, how can you make a difference? Well, step up. Uh, it's a it's a tough time in England and in all countries right now for clinicians in primary care and other areas. Demoralization, burnout, uh, uh, a, a loss of buoyancy is, is plaguing healthcare systems all, all over the world, certainly in the United States and definitely in England. I think it's getting better. I actually have a sense of directionality here. But, but what builds confidence is confidence. It, it's the sense that there are among you in the National Health Service leaders, clinicians, doctors, nurses in primary care who believe it's possible to make change, who believe that you can take control and change the circumstances of care, even under some of the terrible constraints you work under, and through redesign of delivery, bold redesign of delivery, achieve not just the triple aim, better care, better health, and lower cost, but the quadruple aim, including joy in work. This is a time for leadership by example and for uh, conveying to your colleagues a sense of optimism and hope and, and investment and, and uh, internal locus of control that I think you're perhaps, perhaps your membership in the primary care special interest group uh, reflects. Um, I, um, I've been asked for tips, like, so how do you do it? I, I don't, there's no simple answer. Be students of improvement. The Q idea, the idea of, of, a, of a cadre like the Qs in, in England and elsewhere in the UK, it, it, it has a pedigree. And that pedigree is that the methods of improvement matter, just like the methods of medicine matter. Uh, processes and systems, they don't get better automatically. They don't get just better by trying hard or by guessing. They get better through systematic approaches. We call those approaches variously quality improvement or quality management or lean or it's got all sorts of names, but it means the sciences that underlie the ability to actually get together and work on a process. There are methods, learn the methods, use the methods, enjoy the methods, uh, and don't, don't, don't just guess, study. I think the, once you've done that, what you'll learn is that all improvement is change and that the world's too complicated to change uh, kind of in one large step. You don't cross the chasm uh, through uh, one giant change. Um, the, uh, the concept of testing, testing changes, is core to the modern approach to improvement. And I think the cues and the special interest group in primary care you should conceive yourself as continuous testers. What you are is a group of people willing to find an idea, be it from your own brains or a colleague or Scotland or, or Nuka or, or Ghana, to find an idea, bring it local, bring it to your patch and try it out. Try it out fast. Try it out now. Try it out with an open mind. Take some risks and, 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 and become testers. It's the democratization of science that we're talking about. That's what improvement really is. And then by being a special interest group together, you can test for and with each other. All teach, all learn is the, the, the jargon we use at IHI. You all can be a community of testers, um, not alone, but, but learning all the time from each other and from others. I think that's the, the best tip I have, except maybe one other, and that is patients, families, and communities. The, the, the buzzword nowadays is co-production or co-design. That's real. Here's the idea. When you're trying to help somebody, a patient, family, community, the, the best form of helping is, is 
doing the helping with them. Healthcare is not like a manufactured product. It's not like a toaster or a car, which is made by somebody and then delivered to someone else. It's co-produced. It's a service. In its essence, it has to be co-created. What we've done in the sociology of health and medicine is separated the, the beneficiary, the person we're helping, from the producer, you, the clinician. That's wrong. We've got to reunite the people helped with the people helping into a continuous uh, system of interaction, learning, co-design, and co-production. We make health together. We design health together. What does that mean practically? Invite the patients in. Any meeting you have, any time you're together, in any realm for any purpose, have patients and families and communities present, the more the better. Don't fret about getting exactly the right people who are, quote, representative of the patients. Be authentic and, and embracing in your outreach to people to get them in the room with you to help. They will help, but they need to be invited. And you need to overcome the sociologies of mystique and imbalance of power and language gaps and literacy issues, overcome all of that to be able authentically to welcome into the room the people you're trying to help to help you help them better. Co-production, co-design, mutuality, and frankly, patient power. Uh, embrace that. You'll be on the right track. Uh, I'm excited about what you're undertaking. It's wonderful. It's a logical next step to the development of the Q system. I, I commend the the Health Foundation for supporting this effort and, and NHS England and your colleagues throughout the country uh, and throughout the UK for your willingness to invest in this uh, wonderful effort. As I say, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person at this meeting, but I will be at some future meeting soon, I hope and intend. Good luck and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you.